Now we'll talk about the fatty acids part. Now I'm skipping the protein part because most of us know that a uh, protein in moderation that is around 0.8 to 1 gram of protein, it can be, you know, 50% being of high biological value. So when I talk about high biological value, it comes out from the non-vegetarian sources can actually be adequate for a diabetic patient. So if the diabetic patient is a vegetarian, then we will definitely go in for different varieties of dals, uh, milk products. If they are totally a vegan, then we'll prefer, you know, going to uh, an extent where they can have uh, dal and pulses almost, you know, all three meals and including their snacks. So this is what will stand good for protein. And for fatty acids, MUFA fatty acids have found to have a beneficial effect on the glycemic control. Omega-3 to omega-6 uh, still is a controversy because the proportion is set somewhere between 3.3 uh, is to 1 is the normal ratio of omega-3 and omega-6 that has to be given. Again, uh, giving omega-6 to a diabetic patient might increase inflammatory factors is what certain uh, people keep, uh, keep for the point there. So that still has certain controversies there. So when I talk about omega-3, we can get it from fish, uh, algae oil, chia seeds and flax seeds. So I wouldn't recommend to uh, immediately jump into fish oils or algal oils. Having uh, one teaspoon of chia or sabza or flax seeds would stand good for any normal uh, diabetic patient having a, a HbA1c around 8 to 10. And then when we talk about omega-6, soybean, corn, walnuts, sunflower, almonds, and cashew. So most of the nuts have, uh, you know, certain small amount of omega-3 but also have a good amount of omega-6 oil so uh, taking them in moderation like one handful of nuts per day shouldn't cause any problem as such and when I talk about uh, MUFA most of the nut oils are good in MUFA and uh, we have canola and olive oil also joining the list olive oil not really recommended because it isn't really uh, that amicable for an Indian style of cooking so I'll always go with nut oil, groundnut oil, coconut oil, and sesame oil. So all these are really a good source of MUFA. And also they are, uh, you know, a good amount. Uh, they have good amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids as well. So uh, having a combination of oils, physically combining oils also should do rather than using uh, costly and, uh, you know, non-native oils like canola and olive oil. Now, talking about micronutrients, only a few micronutrients have been discussed in this presentation, which really have been uh, shown to have good amount of uh, evidence. So the first one is magnesium. Why magnesium? Because magnesium regulates insulin secretion. Uh, phosphorylation of insulin receptors happen in the presence of magnesium and electrical activities in beta cells is also regulated by magnesium. And with, uh, as we know, most of the uh, cell cy uh, cycles of, uh, involved in metabolism have uh, magnesium as an important cofactor. So all of this leads to uh, magnesium um, taking the podium in, when it comes to micronutrients in diabetes. So what happens in deficiency? There is a deficiency in cell transport, uh, cell glucose transport, decreased cell, uh, cellular glucose utilization and tyrosine kinase deficiency. So all this uh, leading to hyperglycemic symptoms. As well as magnesium supplement, when it comes to magnesium supplementation, uh, researchers have found to have 250 mg of elemental magnesium for three months uh, have shown to have good results. And uh, when it is more than 12 weeks in more than higher doses of 300 mg, that has also uh, found to decrease systolic and uh, diastolic blood pressure in uh, type 2 diabetic patients. So is supplementation th that really necessary? That again depends on the individual. When we do a dietary assessment, you will be able to understand if the patient is having enough amount of magnesium coming in from their diet. So if you find that the diet is really, uh, you know, low in magnesium, that is when you can go in for a magnesium supplement. Uh, for a person who is already having a diet which is rich in magnesium, doesn't really need a magnesium supplementation. So we can also see that there was significant improvement in insulin levels as well as uh, HOMA insulin, resi uh, insulin resistance levels and C-peptides. So it also helps in decreasing your inflammatory markers. Now let's talk about zinc again. Uh, zinc plays an important role in secretion of the insulin and also helps in glucose utilization. And uh, the deficiency is associated with chronic inflammation. So diabetes and inflammation has a very a good correlation so here zinc deficiency will also increase the chances of the person ending up with having 
and uncontrolled diabetes. So zinc basically has an upper tolerable limit of 40 gram per day. And uh, there is no clear uh, clear trials where uh, they have used, you know, a particular dosage for so many months that have been shown to have uh, very good beneficial effects, which can be uh, told with proper uh, um, advantages. So I will always again recommend that uh, giving a normal multivitamin supplementation should do for almost all the uh, trace elements. And chromium again, chromium around 50 to 1000 mg per uh, a day has shown to have effect, uh, a good amount of uh, decrease in A1C levels and IR levels in diabetic patients. So again, uh, chromium, uh, I wouldn't ask most of them to take it as a single separate supplement. Uh, supplementing it with diet as the primary uh, should be the primary goal rather than pushing them pills, um, pushing pills inside of them. Now, when it comes to a uh, day-to-day challenges, so this was all about you know a uh, very subject-oriented uh, uh, discussions that was happening. Now, when I talk about uh, day-to-day challenges, which is like very practical challenges that um, a practitioner might get, is what I have outlined here. So this is about the patient profile spectrum. So when I talk about patient profile spectrum, it's uh, you know a very vast spectrum where you have on on the right hand side of my, me is the health conscious individuals, and on the left we have the not very health conscious individuals. So here is where we have the problem. When people who are really health conscious walk into clinics, what they do is they already search, uh, uh, search about everything, search about the medication, search about the diet that they have to do, and they come and give us, you know, suggestions. So should I follow this or should I follow that? This is the typical mindset. And when I have the other side of the spectrum who are not really health conscious, what they do is they neither take what uh, me or the other practitioners advise. They have their own set of, you know, belief systems where they say that I will be able to control my diabetes all by myself. If they are able to, well and good, but in most cases, they only end up with complications. So where is that we need to focus more is somewhere in the middle where people, uh, you know, are sandwiched between being health conscious and not being health conscious. They know what to do, but they do not know how to do it. So th those are the people who really need, you know, our uh, guidance or assistance. Yeah, I do uh, agree that we also need to focus on other ends of the spectrum as well, but this makes a really large chunk of the population.